The Heart's True Home by Simon Edwards. Animals often possess an amazing ability to find their way back home from places sometimes hundreds and hundreds of miles far away. Seabirds are believed to steer mostly by the sun and stars. The same is true of the humble dung beetle. Sea turtles, as well as cats, navigate via magnetism. Dogs are very big on scent. According to the Bible, God has put eternity in the hearts of men and women, a sort of soul-deep longing that can be squashed or distracted but never wholly diverted by romance, wealth, fame, pleasure, or success. We might think of it as an internal homing beacon, faint but persistent, easily drowned out by competing noises, but always there, in the background, waiting for us to listen, calling us home. One sees this dimension of the human condition brilliantly illuminated in one of the great works of literature, Augustine's Confessions, the first autobiography in recorded history. In the most famous line from that book, Augustine memorably illustrates the human predicament as follows. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Restlessness, that sense of never quite being at home in the world, is a theme that almost every person on the planet can relate to particularly in the West, where our life is often characterized by busyness, instability, and change. The journalist Malcolm Magaridge, who late in life came to Christian faith, writes, The first thing I remember about the world, and I pray it may be the last, is that I was a stranger in it. The feeling which everyone has to some degree, and which is at once the glory and desolation of Homo sapiens provides the only thread of consistency that I can see in my life. G.K. Chesterton, in expression of the same sentiment or feeling, writes, For men are homesick in their own homes, and strangers under the sun. But like Augustine and Marguerite, the feeling does not lead Chesterton to despair, for he recognizes that there is a home for the human soul, though not one found in any particular place per se as the rest of his poem reads, For men are homesick in their own homes, and strangers under the sun, but their homes are under miraculous skies where the Yule tale was begun, a child in a foul stable where the beasts feed and foam. Only where he was homeless are you and I at home. We have hands that fashion and heads that know but our hearts we lost, how long ago, in a place no chart nor ship can show under the sky's dome, to an open house in the evening, home shall men come, to an older place than Eden, and a taller town than Rome, to the end of the way of the wandering star, to the things that cannot be and that are, to the place where God was homeless, and all men are at home. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, left his home in heaven in order to draw us home to himself. Augustine asks, could God have done anything kinder or more generous than for the real, eternal, unchanging wisdom of God itself to condescend, to take on human form. He was born in a dirty stable to a Hebrew peasant girl. He was brought up in an obscure village on the eastern fringe of the Roman Empire. He sweated at a carpenter's bench to support his mother and younger siblings. Eventually, he began his ministry of teaching, healing, and proclaiming the good news that life in the kingdom of God was available for all. 
He had few possessions and no home, no place on which to rest his head. He traveled on foot, ministering from village to village. Those who followed him were plain and earthy folk, mainly fishermen and the like. He made friends with prostitutes and publicans, and laid hands on lepers and outcasts. He scandalized the religious leaders of the day by dining with sinners and pronouncing forgiveness of sin. So they tested him and misrepresented him and tried earnestly to discredit him. Almost all those in power saw him as a nuisance and a threat. Still some, risking their reputations, put their hope and trust in him. But eventually he was arrested and all his followers fled. He was tried as a criminal, and though the Roman governor Pontius Pilate recognized that he was an innocent man, he was sentenced to be flogged and nailed to a cross to die. But he didn't protest nor curse as they spit on his face and pulled out his beard and lacerated his back and crowned his head with thorns. As the cruel nails were driven into his hands and his feet, and as they lifted the cross to the sky, he cried, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And yet his death was not a tragedy, but a victory. It was not the frustration of his mission, but the accomplishment of it. For having assumed our nature as a human being, on the cross he also assumed all our guilt and shame and the penalty they deserved therein. And when it was all done, all paid for, Jesus cried out, It is finished, and died for us. At the heart of Christian faith is not a set of beliefs per se, but an event the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, an historical event with cosmic repercussions, an unthinkable event in light of our pretensions to self-sufficiency, yet one that speaks to our deepest hungers and fears, an event that calls us back to humility and with it, hope. The Bible says that God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Isn't it wonderful to think that God loves the world that much? That he loves you that much? God loves you. The Bible is 100% clear about the fact that he sent his son Jesus Christ into the world to rescue broken people including me, including you, and that he invites us to be reconciled to him in our heart of hearts, to return to him, to come home. In one way, coming home to God is the most difficult thing in the world to do, but in another way, it is the easiest thing in the world to do. It's the hardest thing to do because you have to surrender everything to Jesus and trust Him that He knows best. But it's the easiest thing to do because all you have to do is surrender. Let go. Allow Christ to be the one who directs and manages your life. C.S. Lewis writes, The terrible thing, the almost impossible thing, is to hand over your whole self, all your wishes and precautions to Christ. But it is far easier than what we are trying to do instead. For what we are trying to do is to remain what we call ourselves, to keep personal happiness as our great aim in life, and yet, at the same time, be good. We are all trying to let our mind and heart go their own way, centered on money or pleasure or ambition, and hoping, in spite of this, to behave honestly and chastely and humbly. And that is exactly what Christ warned us you could not do. As he said, a thistle cannot produce figs. 
If I am a field that contains nothing but grass seed, I cannot produce wheat. Cutting the grass may keep it short, but I shall still produce grass and no wheat. If I want to produce wheat, the change must go deeper than the surface. I must be plowed up and resown. Letting go of your own little kingdom, where you call the shots, and stepping into God's kingdom, where he calls the shots. Sounds scary, but it's worth it. And that's because knowing Jesus is the best thing in the world. And that's because he is the best thing in the world, the source and center of all that is good and beautiful and true. He is your heart's true home. for listening. I'm Gabriel Porras, a professional voice artist. Visit me at gabrielvoice.com and radiantwhispers.com and have the most wonderful journey as you return home.